everybody. I'm Marianne Sasaki. You're watching Life in the Law and Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, we, we discuss issues in the law, current, current events, and historical events. Today, we're so lucky to have eminent criminal attorney Victor Baki with me. Welcome, Victor. I'm so glad you're here. And Victor's going to tell us a little bit about what practicing criminal law is like, and then we're going to take we're going to talk about the big, big case that's been in the news for months and months and months since I've been here, which is the Kaloha case, Kaloha. right? Kaloha, Kaloha case. Okay. okay, so welcome. Thank you for welcome having me. Welcome to the show. Thank you for, th thank you for coming. Um, where should we start? So are you from, are you local? I'm originally from Seattle. Oh, um, okay. But I've been here... 30 years now, okay. so I've been here longer than any place right. else, so I guess you could say. And I, 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 did, uh, I did my research and I saw that you went to Bolt Law School, yeah? Yes, I went to University of Washington for undergrad and then uh, University of California, Berkeley, also known as Bolt Hall, for law school. And you clerked at the Supreme Court as well of Hawaii, yeah? Correct. Uh, while I was in law school, I served as a judicial extern for Chief Judge David Ezra, who is now retired from the District of Hawaii, but he was a pretty high-powered judge here. And then I also clerked for the Supreme Court of Hawaii before starting a career at the city prosecutor's office. Okay. Did you always know you wanted to be a criminal lawyer? Yes. Really? Yes. Yeah. Me. Even before law school? or? Well, I wanted to be a doctor first, oh, okay. you know, like most lawyers, and then... Uh, and then when I decided not to do that, I decided to go to law school, and then from then on, though, it was pretty much always criminal law. Because criminal is, is, you know, I'm a business lawyer, and it's so far from my practice, and I've on a, several occasions been the last person in the office, and so I've had to go down and do an arraignment or something, and it's, I, it's just a whole different world for me. I mean, it's a whole, it's a whole different set of rules, and uh, it's a different way of practicing law. Well, the thing that always intrigued me about the criminal law is it's pure law. It really is the essence of society. I mean, it's the rule of law. It's what keeps everything together. It's what allows people like you to practice business law because you need to have that, that history that we have. I mean, it's almost a historical um, degree when you're going through law school. You're learning law, but you really have to learn the history and how did we get here? Right. How did we end up with a right to a jury trial? How did we end up with um, proof beyond a reasonable doubt? Um, just things like that, uh, innocent until proven guilty, all those type of concepts that people tend to take for granted. So it's, it's fascinating in a lot of different ways. Uh, so you see it working, and, and you see it working every day. I, I never, I very rarely, burden of proof never, very rarely comes across my desk. And, you know, you, right. you're, you're the kind of lawyer that when people, I tell people I'm a lawyer, they think of you. They think of the criminal lawyer. That's what they see on, on TV, TV. And, and, and that's what they think of as a lawyer. So really I wanted to discuss this, this fascinating case with the police chief. And um, it's been going on, I've only been here for a year and a half, but I, th it, I think it's been going on since I've been here. I know it's been going on for a very long time. So could you give us a little background about what how did, how did this begin and where are we going and where it is now? Because I know that there's a new, a new civil, federal civil case is filed against the chief, yeah? Correct. Yeah. Well, in a nutshell, the chief of police is married to one of the high-ranking deputy prosecuting attorneys, a woman that I used to work with named Kathy Kealoha. And um, she's been under a cloud of suspicion for some... Some, for some irregular activity, let's say, within the prosecutor's office. Um, and then there was also um, some suspicion cast on her about some of her business dealings with family members when she was working as a private attorney. And that ended up working its way through the court system, and she actually was awarded a judgment in her favor for that. But the, the biggest problem they had in that case was um, at some point she accused her uncle who was the person that was suing her and she was countersuing um, she accused that uncle of stealing her mailbox and now it's turning out that that whole thing was completely fake fabricated it was huh? completely fabricated and she used her connections with the police department to get this elite group of officers that answer only to the chief and the first thing that's funny about that is 
almost nobody knew that this special division even existed. It was almost kind of like the secret. That's like Stasi or it, something. It was like, it, was like the, it was like the Gestapo. It was right. like the chief's secret police. Force. Wow. And so, you know. So um, no provision in the law made for it. Nobody knew. They just, no. how did they How did they get them, gather them together? What, did they swear them to secrecy? I mean, how did they do it? Well, that's what it looks like. And one of them now has broken ranks and has pled guilty to, um, to fraud. And... Um, to basically framing this uncle right. and so that's now since that just came down last week now the chief has been given a target letter which means he's being requested to testify before the grand jury but he's also being warned that he is also a suspect in all of this and so that he should be careful when testifying because he may incriminate himself Wow that's, um, that's kind of amazing. It's kind of amazing just that the p chief of police and somebody from the prosecutor's office would be, I guess, you know, I mean, it, they show that kind of involvement on TV, but, you know, it's, it's uh, you have to be extra careful, I think, if, that, if you want to do something like that. But it doesn't sound like these two are extra careful at all. No, and <laughs> you say TV, this almost reads like a made-for-TV script because some of it just seems so ridiculous and unnecessary. Um, it's I know, it's very dramatic. That's the thing that caught my attention. Because um, I don't usually, I watch political news. I'm a political news junkie, so I don't usually watch the local news. But when I do watch the local news, um, it, it really is such a, e each turn of events is so dramatic. And, it, and it's silly and dramatic. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, 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 you know, it's not like big it, stakes, you know. It's not murders. It's not drugs. It's nothing yeah. like that. It's like... A family dispute over money right. and but what's happened is it's taken over a year for this um, investigation to be to be coming forth with um, and it really started in part with the chief because what happened was during the trial that they actually tried the uncle um, in federal court with a criminal offense for stealing the mailbox and the chief actually blurted out information during his testimony that he was specifically told not to say. Really? He, it was in federal court because it was the mail? It was what? in federal court because it was a theft of a mailbox. Amazing. Okay. So it was a federal offense, uh -huh. and, and the uncle was appointed a, a uh, public defender. Uh -huh. And But during that trial, the chief engaged in misconduct, and the judge threw the case out. And that's what triggered then the investigation because they started realizing that this evidence wasn't really credible right and so when it's coming from police officers there's a bigger problem if you're you know if you have a regular witness and they're not credible the, the case just gets dismissed but when the police officers you need an investigation found, you need an investigation <laughs> because and, yeah they're you know and there's just been a long series since, since chief kailoa came into into power uh, which we shouldn't even say that word, like power. They make it sound like it's some huge political thing. But once he became acting chief, right. he's had nothing but problems. The, there's been nothing but arrest after arrest, after indictment, after civil lawsuit. I personally filed a lawsuit against the chief in which the city awarded me $4.7 million. Really? The largest, well, not me personally, but on behalf of my yeah, clients. Client. But that was the largest um, single settlement against the Honolulu Police Department in state history. Wow. So, um, so it, it, this, it sounds like a field day for lawyers, actually. It actually is right now. But to their credit, they are not lying down. They are firing back, filing all of their own lawsuits. So now the city's running up a couple million dollars again in bills to defend them. They're saying that they're suing the Ethics Commission. They're saying that they're being targeted they're, um, for no reason by the Ethics Commission. Um, their names are being dragged through the mud. And I pointed out in several interviews that it's very ironic to hear those kinds of accusations coming from a police chief and the right. prosecutor who all they do all day long is is file accusation against people. They throw people in jail. They don't give them a chance to clear their names. But when it happens to the chief and his wife, suddenly it's like, oh, this is a horrible system. Dude, that's spoken like a true criminal attorney, I have to say, <laughs> Victor. I, that, that's, well, that's a very... Uh, uh, well, I wouldn't, yeah. No, <laughs> I, I will say this. I mean, personally, I, I spent seven and a half years in the prosecutor's mm -hmm. here. So I'm not a bleeding heart liberal, mm -hmm. you know, hide behind the Constitution type of defense attorney. Mm -hmm. 
but I can see the whole thing. Right. I've seen the inner workings of the prosecutor's office. I've seen the inner workings of the police department. And I've been in prison, which is why I'm wearing this Aloha right. shirt today. I just came from the federal detention center. Yes, we, we note uh, that you look very handsome, but had you not been to prison, you would have worn if I'd a been suit in court, and tie. Yes. If he had been before, right, exactly. But, but no reason but for suit and tie here. No, but, but I've <laughs> dealt with the probation system. I've right. dealt with the parole system, the prison. And, you know, the only way you can truly be at the top of the game is to have been on the inside of all those organizations because the criminal justice system depends on a lot of moving parts. And if any of those moving parts fail, then the system fails, including the judiciary. So right. like I said, I've worked with the judiciary. I know what it's like. I haven't been a judge, but I've worked well, you've been side clerk, by yeah. side. I've been the clerk for the judge. So, um, and you can really see, and it, whether it's a victim that is, that is harmed by the prosecutors not prevailing a case um, in a case, it's just you need everything to work, and if it doesn't, then people actually get hurt. In the civil world, as you know, it's all about money. You can always make money. How do you make whole people whole? You make them with money. But how do you give back somebody 20 years of their life? How do you give them back their reputations? Um, and that's where... Well, those, yes, this, those are certainly very weighty matters when you're, when you're considering, you know, that you're doing... You're, you're like a surgeon, right? You hold people's right. lives in your hand, and you... Uh, well, you have to get it right. That's yeah. the bottom line. And, but you need everybody to do that. And you need people to believe in the system. So when you have the chief of police and a high-ranking prosecutor coming under this kind of suspicion, and they just seem to keep blowing it off, blowing it off, not taking any responsibility for anything, um, it erodes the confidence. And well, it, that's it, another problem. It into did itself. for me. I, I, you know, I said this to my husband. My husband's local. He's from Kailua. And I said to him, you know, it, this makes Honolulu seem like um, like a 20s gangster movie. Not like 20s gangsters, but like a 20s gangster movie. It's like almost like a movie, like, a, uh, you know, because it's so, it's so, you know, dramatic and event after event and, and who is so intertwined, the husband and wife and, and you know, being in the prosecutor's office and the chief of police. And, and, and it, it has also a little bit of a small town vibe, doesn't it? Or is it me? I, no, it, it is a very small town vibe. I mean, I've always said about Honolulu. But Honolulu, Honolulu isn't. You it's think not. It is? There's 700,000 people yeah, in the county. Yeah, I think it's a big city. But this has a very... But political-wise, I mean... You know, I've never been any place where I can walk down the street like I can here and see the prosecutor, see one of the federal judges, and they'll say hello to you. Um, you know, no security, no running around. Right. Um, you know. I agree. It's, it's, I agree. It's, you have access to people here like you just never would. I mean, you don't drive on the mainland and see people waving signs and actually have, you know, Kirk Caldwell, the mayor, with a, with a beautiful lay on the corner in the morning oh, waving at you. you know? absolutely. Absolutely. And then you, it gives you that connection with these people. Right. But at the same time, that small town feel uh, can can breed corruption real quick and the police department's been under suspicion for a lot of stuff for a long time um, which is really unfortunate um, but they're responsible for the way things are handled and so let me ask you so why wouldn't the chief of the prosecutor's office wouldn't they put somebody even on paid suspension or suspend them or that is a very good question um, and it's one that hasn't been answered yet because it's expected that uh, the prosecutor, Keith Kaneshiro, may at some point be a target of this corruption scandal as well. Um, for example, I was personally involved in, we had a huge case here before you got here. Let, me, let me stop you. We'll, oh. I'd love to hear about your case. We're going to take a quick break okay. and then we'll talk about your huge case, which I'm dying to hear about. <laughs> Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying $5 billion a year for imported oil. My job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning, better everything. 
So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other Monday, code green aloha, and thank you very much. Hi, you're watching Marianne Sasaki and Life in the Law. Uh, on Wednesdays between 1 and 1.30 on Think Tech Hawaii. We're lucky today to have Victor Baki. We're talking about the uh, Kaloha case. I don't know why I can't say that. The police, the issue of the police chief and, and corruption going on in the police, uh, in the police force and in the, in the prosecutor's office. So tell me about this big case you had that you thought would be interesting that we went to break, right before we went to break you mentioned. Well, you were asking about the prosecutor and how has the prosecutor come into play in all this? Right. Wh why, why wouldn't he sanction? Well, because they've worked very closely together on some other big cases, which I was starting to mention about the largest um, gambling uh -huh. uh, case that we had here in history where they shut down all these game rooms that were operating in broad daylight, had been approved for operation uh, by the Liquor Commission, and Keith Conishiro decided on his own that these were illegal but he couldn't prove it under the law. So they went through, it's, it's a long story, but at the end of the day, um, they presented indictments, um, the largest, like I said, in state history, and then uh, within a very short time, myself and several other lawyers were able to uncover that the grand jury proceeding had been um, made up almost completely of fabricated testimony, improper evidence, and the judge threw the case out, and Kathy Kalo had disappeared. She was subpoenaed as a witness to testify for it. She wasn't ordered, held accountable for anything. The other prosecutor that was involved, he left the office immediately thereafter. Um, and then for two years, we heard nothing. And then Keith Conishiro, the prosecutor, tries to reindict, gives the case right back to Kathy K. Aloha. And that time, we went right back in, made the same arguments, basically, and the second judge threw it out and said, I believe, something to the effect of, like, at the very best case, this was complete incompetence, and at the worst, it was absolute Some nefarious, fraud. yeah. Yeah. Well, I I'm awestruck that there, there are no consequences, although I, I suppose, you know what, there's lots of great crimes and no consequences, but... Um, where this is such a transparent issue. I mean, people can see what's going on, and aren't, isn't any, anybody demanding, you know, justice? Or who's well, somebody must be the police. Infuriated. The police commission is supposed to be watching the chief, and they've come under great criticism, and in my opinion, right, rightfully so. Uh, they did nothing. They knew that all this is going on, and they just said, "Well, we don't know anything about this." But you ask any person on the street, they're like, "Oh my God, what's up with the, this is the chief of police?" Hawaii is a land of relationships right you know when I first came here people were saying it's all about relationships and I I, I mean I knew that in, in New York it was a little like that but New York is very much a meritocracy you know you sort of get ahead you know um, everybody comes there and we but but this is sort of uh, the dark side of that that this is a state of uh, based upon relationships a culture based upon relationships because it seems like there actually are relationships where there shouldn't be any relationships so is, th is there a way to go outside even the police commission I mean can a special prosecutor be appointed or somebody well, that's really where we're at right now the feds have come in the federal government has come in they brought a prosecutor in from San Diego so um, that's usually the step in police corruption cases or like when you see these police shootings okay they right. can't try the local community, right, so right. they bring in the Department of Justice. Right, right. Um, so that's so that we, so we're at that point so right we're, now. So we're at that, and we have been for over a year. And the police commission is <laughs> was so one-sided, backing up the police. They refused to even acknowledge that there was even a grand jury investigation going on. So now, and the the problem is, the police commission is appointed in large part by the mayor. So that reflects poorly on the mayor. So to keep himself looking good he's now put two new uh, um, appointees a former lawyer and former prosecutor i believe she was um, and a former supreme court justice and circuit court judge to come in and be a little more law enforcement with a little more um, legal experience rather than just a bunch of People that's like closing the do barn door after the horse got out. I mean, it's a little bit, you know. It oh, it's very self-serving. It's very self-serving. Those people should have been on there from, from day right, one. Right, I mean, right. the police commission here really has no teeth at all, and the teeth that they do have, they don't use. So how do we clean things up? What do we do? Well, we wait for the grand jury indictment to come down, and the, the federal government will sweep pretty heavily. They've already gotten one, one conviction out of this, and... Uh, I think there's going to be several more. Really? So, yeah. Really? 
Of the major players, you think? Of the major players. I think Kathy K. It, it all seems to center around Kathy K. Aloha. And, um, you know, the chief... Did you work with her when you worked there? I worked with her for several years, yeah. Oh, okay. So you know her personally so, also. Yes, yes. So it centers on her. That's, uh, I guess, you know... One reason, you know, I'm very, I'm very, very, very liberal, and um, I, I got an uh, offer from the DA's office, and I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't in that interested in criminal law, but I also was very uh, f trepidatious about uh, working for the state because you have so much power when you work for the state. You know, I mean, I don't mean the state like as in Hawaii. I mean the government, and you know, it's really amazing how you sort of isolated and you really think you can do anything and you can have a secret police force and you can you can manipulate facts and you, it, it, it's it's just stunning and and if when abused when that power is abused it's just d devastating i mean it's a it's a real uh, affront to the citizenry i think well you know I, I i spent almost 10 years in government work and one of the problems there is you don't have the invisible hand of the market motivating people. So people aren't there for the money. Right. Okay? They're there for the stability right. and the paycheck. And some of them enjoy their work. Other, it's very tedious right. clerical type work. But the problem, in my opinion, that you really run into is you have these people that their whole lifestyle is dependent, especially in Hawaii. They're paycheck to paycheck. They need those jobs. So when their supervisors lean on them and say, this is the way something's going to be done, it's very difficult for them to speak up. They don't really have any leverage, and they go along with it. And hand in hand with that goes the supervisor, because the supervisor is not there you know, as part of a private business trying to get that you know, huge bonus. What they tend to do is they tend to be more into the power aspect. Right. Of it. I, well, I think I always thought that you know the police. Well, I mean, the police uh, attracted people who uh, liked a certain uh, to exert a certain amount of power over others, and and it has to be the same with the prosecutor's office. Although I mean, it's 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 harder to see, but you can pick and choose, and you can you can really make quite an impact by the uh, right. you know. Well, by the know, wideness of it, your ability to choose. You know, I'm, and I'm sure people say exactly the same thing about private practice and everything. You've got a bunch of people that just, you know, are money hungry and they'll, you know, cheat their customers and they'll do whatever. But like I said, there's that invisible hand of the market that if you act that way too long or too often, hopefully your company will fail because right. you're cheating customers, you're abusing people, right. things like that. Right. But when you're the government, you don't have that that right. buffer you can go on there is it's very difficult to challenge that's right. why even in these recent police shootings and my brother's actually a retired police officer who was shot once uh on duty but you know nowadays you start to really get a different story sometimes of things with these body cams and oh, the I, video yeah. cameras and everything and it's and it goes both ways sometimes they show the cops are completely lying and other times they show that the victims and their family are completely lying do you lying. support that as a criminal lawyer do you support oh, absolutely. body cams i yeah. think the body cams and any any cams cameras recording devices anything that they can use to get the best evidence is what it's about right. and uh, um you know, there's an example, this is a classic example of problems with HPD here. They treat prostitution here as a petty misdemeanor. Okay. Okay. And because of that, the person cannot get a, a trial by a jury. It has to just be settled by a judge. So what, because they know it's never going to go in front of a jury, they never record the conversations between their decoy officers and the, the Johns, so to speak, that are soliciting it. And why wouldn't they do that? They do that because they know that they're lying and cheating and right. tricking they these can people make it up, get this. Right, they exactly. can make it up, and it's just going to be a judge saying, well, the police officer says this, and the poor other person says this. It makes absolutely no reason when the actual crime is the words exchanged. Right, right. Yeah, because people don't actually have sex. They make an agreement to have sex. Right. So why wouldn't you record that? Right, right. And they refuse to do it. That's fascinating. Right. But I can guarantee you that if they had to go before a jury, they would record it because a jury would demand to say, well, if you're saying this guy's guilty because he said things, why didn't you record right. it? Right. Why should I believe you over somebody right. else? And, but in, but in, like in, you're right, in a bench trial setting, in a, there's a lot of implicit power there and the respect of the implicit power and, uh, the, and the institution. That's fascinating. Somebody should organize... Uh, prostitutes for civil rights actually i know somebody that's doing that actually but i mean that's like a, that's a civil rights issue I, you know
There's, well, it's, uh, prostitution's been a long problem, but it's also been the source of a lot of accusations of misconduct by the police department. Anyone in this town can drive down Capilani Boulevard or anywhere down Waikiki and see these stores that have black windows that just have a <laughs> sign that says open, you right, know, right, at 2 right. o'clock in the morning, right. okay? Everybody knows what's going right. on in there, but it's selective enforcement, and that's why you always, every so often, they, they sweep the place out and you get this... Right. Um, you know, allegations of somebody taking bribes from the mama sons or the girls or right. whatever. And it's, you know, it's a very small town. You know, right. if they really wanted to crack down on these morals offenses, for example, they could. But people get paid off right. and things get done um, on the side. And it's gone on that way forever. And I think that's why this particular grand jury investigation that's being done by the federal government is taking so long, simply because every time they get onto one, you know, one idea of wrongdoing, it uncovers three it's others. Rich. It's rich. It so uncovers rich. three and others. Pull, and it just, them. <laughs> they just keep, they, they, have, they have more than they ever right. bargained for. They must be know? like, it's, you know, what is going on over there? They're like isolated from the, you know, right. you, well, actually, but the, the, the FBI, the, the, the prosecutor would be from the, uh, the state. I mean, the, the, would be the federal prosecutors located in this state. I'm thinking like they're coming no, from no. Washington. No, the federal prosecutor that's doing this like, investigation is yeah. out of San Diego. Right. Oh, that's what I thought. So yeah. they must really be like, you know, these people are on an island far away. Nobody thinks, everybody thinks they can do whatever they want. Nobody's watching. I mean, I, I kind to feel that way sometimes you know it, it's it it, it it must be wild for them it must be you know i can just imagine their conversations yeah it's um you know it's we're not the only jurisdiction with these kind of problems oh no not so, at all not at all but um but there is a sense of security that you know we are isolated and we do have our own ways and you know, there is there is a little bit of that, I think, you know. But so, certain towns had that as well, I think. That's right. right. But, but at this time, you know, to be fair to everyone, this is the process. And I always tell my clients, you know, justice is a process. It's not a verdict, okay? Because anytime there's a verdict in a trial, one side thinks they didn't get justice. You know, right. If there's a murder case and the guy gets acquitted, the family thinks, well, he murdered my brother and got away with it. Right. And if the guy gets convicted, the other that person's family think, oh, he was innocent and he was wrongfully convicted. Right. So justice is the process, not the verdict. And that's where we still are with these guys, is in the process. Right, the process. But the it's process, though, alone should be enough for these two people to step back. And I've called for them along, I believe, with Senator Espero, for these two individuals to step down but, and well, let the, the investigation... did the step down for a month? He, or, or didn't no, he, he never has. He just stepped down once he was notified that he's a possible subject of a the restricted duty. Oh, he didn't. He's on restricted duty for thirty days. It's uh, that's well. What, what happens is whenever officers are involved in some type of misconduct, like just a simple shooting, okay, they'll be they'll be restricted of police powers. That's ROPA. You'll see right. the thing. But in his case, because he's the chief, he actually was removed completely. Oh, okay. Hmm. So. Well. This is fascinating. I can talk, can talk about this all all day, all night because it, it's just so um, it, it it it's so like rich, as you said, full of issues, full of uh, people acting like people, you know, and mm -hmm. and you, you know, like a drama. And so I'm so happy you joined us today. Mm -hmm. But and but I, I do just want to make clear sure. that right now the KLOs have not been charged with anything. Okay. Um, there's just simply an investigation going on, and so. You know, they live by the same rules as the rest of right. us do. We so should, innocent until proven innocent guilty. Innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, we, we should we should yes. That's that's a very good disclaimer and I'm glad I'm glad you said it. So thank you, Victor Baki. If you a criminal lawyer, this is your man. This this guy is all over the place. And uh, thank you for coming by today. Thank you for watching Life in the Law. I'm Marianne Sasaki. Until next time. <laughs>